Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin, and we are a few minutes late starting today, but we are starting nonetheless with Digital Rebar Provision Meetup number 41. Uh, last week, we had a tremendous meetup with an awful lot of great information about Terraform V2 provider, talking about Terraform V2 and pooling and marrying the two. Uh, we also had uh, Fantastic presentation, David Young, uh, down under somewhere below the equator line, who uh, gave us some uh, presentation on the Kubernetes components that he's been working on. Uh, David's going to give us a little bit more about some of the integrations he's done with Ceph and marrying Ceph and Crib pieces together. Uh, but also, we have a fairly big uh, topic agenda for today, which is Digital Rebar Provision, which will become Digital Rebar Platform. Uh, version 3 has moved to version 4, and there's a lot of things uh, in store and a lot of changes sort of on the horizon. Uh, we took a tremendous amount of input from folks uh, around um, both the commercial side with our customers and also from the community side uh, input on the various things that were important within digital rebar. And there were some very clear um, trends and directions that were iterated over and over again. And we'll talk about those in our discussion uh, going forward today. Um, First of all, uh, let's just talk about generally the, the split from V3 to V4. And I'm going to, uh, Rob, are you actually with us now? Do, 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 do. If you are, you're on mute. Yeah, hold on just a second. Sure. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So you so wanted, Rob, uh, I just wanted to kick over to you and just give us sort of an overview about the split and what we're looking to accomplish here from the V3 to V4 and kick off the discussion. I'd be happy to. So um, the and I'm in a in a place a little bit of background noise, so bear with me, please. So what what we've done with V3 to V4 um, actually has very few impacts on the API at all and on how digital rebar uh, operates and is, is used going forward. Um, the change does allow us to start making a number of uh, enterprise scale enhancements that we've been holding off on uh, and customers have been asking for. So basically what has happened between V3 and V4 is the code that we had been uh, using to run digital rebar, what we call the back end of that code. Uh, Racken is now maintaining that as an internal uh, component for the infrastructure, which allows us to build in uh, scale improvements, security improvements, uh, multi-site management, a lot of these, these features that have been sort of coming in the system, um, we can now basically fully implement within the digital rebar platform. And this is really how we see it. Digital rebar v4 is this, is a, uh, rethinking of digital rebar not as a provisioning tool but as a platform uh, and so within that context all of the pieces that Rackin has been building and in the past uh, putting behind our uh, proprietary license the IPMI drivers rain BIOS configuration image-based deployment pooling APIs um, burn-in classifier there's a, a laundry list of, of amazing functionality that are really capabilities and components for the catalog on the platform. Uh, all of those things we moved into the open uh, because this is what we've been hearing from you, our community, where you wanted to contribute, collaborate, where you want to see the code, where you want to make improvements and enhancements. And so the change from V3 to V4, while immediately having very little API impact, has tremendous impact in the ability for people using the platform to be part of contributing to making the platform uh, more integrated, have more capabilities, uh, basically move faster uh, at operations platform. And so those are sort of the, the basics of how this, the system has been 
change between three and four. Uh, you know, from an API perspective, very small difference. Uh, as you've seen, as we've been sort of working through bumps and, and changes, there's quite a big um, change in how we build the process and, and how things go on. And I know, um, Shane, I'm assuming we'll, I'm gonna yield the floor for technical discussions because there, there are some technical uh, changes that we've been needing to make also, and so um, I'll let others speak to the technical changes. Okay, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, I've got lots of people bouncing in and out. Uh, Greg, I wanted to kick over to you. Can you give us sort of a, just a real fast um, 22,458 foot view of some of the architectural uh, changes that we had to do in relation to the realignment from V3 to V4, the big um, moving parts? So from a code perspective, very little changed in the actual implementation of things. Um, to keep track of the licensing changes and stuff, we altered the plugin versions a little bit and updated the licensing and where licenses are validated so that plugins are simpler and don't have a lot of that code in them anymore. Um, as a process, as part of that, we've also created some new repos that get built um, and moved a bunch of stuff into existing repos. So if you're used to trolling around in the digital rebar provision content tree, you'll see there's a lot more content in it now. Um, from the task library to various OSs to um, all sorts of things that we've been playing with over time so that people can start to see how to build content packs in a much brighter, broader and defined pattern. Um, that way we can also track issues against them out there and other stuff like that. The second big change is that there's a new repo, um, digital rebar uh, provision dash plugins, and most of the plugins got moved into that space. This includes the RAID, the BIOS, the IPMI, and various other pieces like that. The timing of my phone calls are amazing. Um, and so the, um, all the plugins are visibly available. The thing to realize there is that um, many have asked, how would I write a plugin? Um, and so Shane, you're wandering around on that page. If you, if you go to um, just to add dash provision or a dash. So that's, yeah, that's the, yeah, he's getting there. There you go. So now if you scroll down in the plugins one, you'll actually see what we kind of mean. Well, some, it's still mostly right, actually. Um, what's actually gonna be required to implement a plugin, the APIs, how it goes through, the various uh, wrappers and stuff. And then there's actually all the examples in there. And so the uh, gives you examples, how to inject content layers, even how to get documentation for your plugins potentially added into our own, that kind of stuff. So there's all sorts of information now about plugins and how to build them and what the uh, plugins can actually do. And like I said, now you have full visibility into, um, if you scroll up to the top, most of the, all the plugins, so, and you can go wander around in their code. Um, scroll up to the top for a second. The plugins actually live under the command, yeah, the commands directory. So there you can go look and see what we mean by the various plugins and how they exist today. Okay. And some of them are experimental and some we have managed and facilitate more, so. Um, so there you go. That's the ability changes of how you go find the thing. 
Which plugin did you say would really be the best to use as a skeleton if we want to develop our own? Okay, so the the follow up question to that is, what did you want your plugin to do? <laughs> Because there's two kind of things that a plugin can do. A plugin can provide actions, like on machine objects, or it can pay attention to events. And so, or both, or both, for example. And so, um, or they can just provide things. So, like the BIOS plugin, for example, is just a delivery mechanism for providing a static binary that knows how to manage BIOS and a content pack that manages that together. Um, IPMI is an example of something that provides actions on machines in the sense that it's the thing that actually provides an example of power cycle, for example. So that's an example of an action on the machine that gets provided. Um, for paying attention to events, um, yeah, go into IPMI. So there, for example, is the action function. The action function is what actually allows you to define what an action should do, and it calls out to various things, right? So that's the basic model for that. The definition of the action is at the top of the function, and you actually define that. Oh, it's in the other function, but anyway. Yeah, it's in main doctor. Yeah, not, not IPMI is, the, is one that doesn't follow the pattern that all the other plugins do. It was one of our first ones, and we didn't follow. We, we, well, it used to, but then we added Redfish and. Uh, yeah, so and in general, support, so the plugins really operate on a name, the plugin, the thing you were going to call it, dot .go, and that's how you see most of it. IPMI split up into different pieces. Um, but anyway, you define the structure to DRP, and that structure then tells whether it's going to have actions, whether it's going to listen to events, whether it's going to do both. And so, so that's IPMI. If you go to like Slack, for example, which is mediocre, actually, if you go to FileBeat, for example, that's one that pays attention to events. So in this case, FileBeat doesn't have necessarily an action command. It basically has a publish function, which receives event streams. And then based upon the event streams, it does various operations on them. And then in this case, sends the message to a file that then FileBe picks up to send to Elasticsearch. So that's an example of processing the event streams. So, and then that's just the writing of it. But, so that's an example. Okay, so, sorry, Greg, go ahead. No, that's it. So that's kind of the, the layout of what's available um, from a, how do you get stuff? Where is stuff coming from? Um, nothing is stored in GitHub anymore. Everything is stored in AWS. This allowed us to have the catalog improvements that you're beginning, beginning to see, or you can pull things from the catalog, from the CLI, and it's just one location where everything kind of flows out of. So um, realize that's what's happening too. Okay. One of the interesting Go ahead. <laughs> what I wanted to touch on was uh, one of the big changes, which I don't know that sort of came to light, is uh, the API is still open. The agent CLI is still open and available in the original digital rebar provision uh, repo. And that's important because we're main ensuring that we want to maintain uh, in the open source and full compatibility for API. And so for those of you interested in looking at the API and how the API works, that's a good place in digital rebar provision API. Uh, the CLI is extremely rich as well, which feeds off the API. And um, that's part of the separation 
in content moving from the core platform underneath to open and which we were just talking about provision content and provision plugin uh, which is where most of all the community members have asked us for access to be able to enhance fix, make better add features capabilities how to replicate and do cool things so those are sort of um, major primary separating parts uh, API open, content open, plugins open. Yeah. Some other things to note real quick. Can you go to the provision content real quick? So in there you'll see um, a whole bunch of new ones. The hardware support for updating and burning BIOSes and flashes and stuff are in there. Um, some of the others were there, like Crib and Sledgehammer Builder, um, but you also now see some of the other OS support from Core OS and all that stuff for now. Um, Rancher OS and some of those tools are out there now. So even even some of our really experimental things like um, Prometheus monitoring is as a content pack to deploy a pre Prometheus monitoring system, right? Yeah, that's that's a little creaky around the uh, edges. Most edges. <laughs> well, it actually deploys DRP itself. So from DRP, you can deploy DRP, and then it sets up Prometheus uh, and the agent for Prometheus and registers all of them and enables you to do profiling of the DRP servers, design more of a uh, set up DRP and, and test and, and profile metrics for DRP. Um, but it is also good for just setting up Prometheus as well if you strip out the DRP parts. Yeah. So there's you, there's all sorts of our intermediate projects, so people can see that too. And so um, going forward, we have a, a number of significant changes for V4 that we would like to make, which a lot of this alignment helps us get there. Um, can you give us sort of a, a brief rundown of some of those changes we're looking at, Greg? So um, some of them are the tight integration of the manager and pooling functions into DRP itself so that those can become more first class operations and more API aware operations. Currently, as plugins, they function or can function, plugin notwithstanding, I know there's issues that we're working through, but the idea is that some of those things can be better handled from a HA data passing control if it's more integrated into the platform. So there's that part, it's one thing. Um, boot ins, um, as people are now playing with them more and more, are finding that as our first defined structure whenever when we first made DRP, it's V2, aging. in fact. Huh? Yeah, it's yeah. it's aging poorly and needs to have some tweaks done to it. Um, so we will probably have some new migratory con construct that replaces bootems that lets you have better specificity and do more parameterization around it so that you don't have to do the massive clone loops that you have to do today to update and control bootems. That should let us do, hope, some of the goals of that will be ability to not necessarily have to directly tie a bootem to an ISO SHA pair at construction time, let that be a bit more dynamic. And then uh, more parameterization in the various sections so that you can do parameter replacement for things like kernels and boot ims and init RD lists and some of that other stuff. Um, that's kind of where we're looking at going. The idea there is like, if you're watching the VMware boot -imv explosion, just to support the 5,000 different ESXi versions that exist in, um, in the way VMware and their, and the vendors work together um, that's just not sustainable. And so um, 
we need, and the same thing applies to Red Hat and CentOS and Ubuntu and a lot of those things, right? Um, At least you don't have to worry about a Dell or HP or Lenovo specific version of uh, yeah. RHEL. Yeah, but nonetheless, um, trying to address some of those concerns. Those are probably the two biggest V4 uh, coming changes. The boot inv one will most likely be uh, maybe API breaking, and so we may rev the API from V3 to V4, but there's still some design work and probably discussion in the community about what, what that needs to be and what people want in that. So if you've got a list of uh, boot inv headaches that you want to throw onto the pile, send, send us the email. Put it in the community. Yeah. Make More. sure to at message me because I'm probably going to be the one that deals with it. Yeah, that's Victor. So Victor anyway. loves boot ends. Yeah. So that's those are the probably two big ones. Um, and then um, there's a whole host of custom UX stuff that um, we're customizing the UX that uh, we're keeping internal for the time being because we're not sure what that should look like quite yet um, and how that's gonna be the most usable. And so you, if you've been launching the community, you'll have seen some of those lists of things like um, custom columns and those kind of things are beginning to show up so that you can alter that stuff, but it goes farther than that in that uh, custom pages and custom views and preset filters and preset action sets and stuff like that are becoming more of an option or more of a capability. Um, and so look out for some of those things too. But I think that's kind of what we've got right now. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick pause from us babbling at all of you. There's a fair number of folks um, meet up today with us. Thank you all of you for joining. Um, I wanted to toss it back out to the, the community though, if you have any questions about what we've covered to date. I mean, we covered kind of a broad range of the V3, V4 separation, um, but we'd love to hear from you guys on questions or thoughts or comments. So I'm gonna sort of just leave it hanging there. Anyone raise your hand, unmute yourself, fire away. Um, it looks like we already have a couple of questions in community asking about uh, asking about the Foreman and possible repository and release management uh, compared to Foreman and Cobbler from uh, Milland. It looks like no idea how to actually pronounce that. That's that's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So repo management. Uh, we already have a. Uh, kind of convoluted system in place for that. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, depending on exactly what you're talking about, um, for a lot of uh, defining custom content, uh, that's what content packs are for. Um, for defining uh, like uh, OS package repositories and the like, um, we have mm -hmm. a package repositories parameter that is uh, defined as part of just the core content layer. Um, and I'm always welcome to help people out with uh, getting it to work for their use case or expanding it to work if it does, if we can't get it to work with their use case. Um, the the way it works right now is uh, kind of arcane, and I have it uh, documented in our uh, docs uh, in the architecture documentation. Uh, but I understand that it is not an intuitive thing to find immediately. It's uh, okay. it's on the slate for future UX improvements. So. Okay. Yeah, we can touch base a little later on. Maybe later on, I can take your contact information from David, and uh, maybe we can spawn separate trade or something, or continue on this one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm available on. I'm just uh, Victor on Slack, so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah Lothar, actually. Sorry. And uh, if you just you know poke me in community, I'm generally hanging around. Yep. No problem. Thank you. No problem. 
And then the versus discussion we'll deal with in a different venue because that's a longer topic. Okay, great. Um, any other questions from community? Oh, yeah, as Greg was saying, we do want to do a versus discussion because we get this all the time. What are some of the key differences between digital rebar, the platform versus core, uh, cobbler, foreman, mass, stacky, insert your 1990s era uh, provisioning platform name here. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm showing my colors there. Apologies. <laughs> uh, and any other um, questions out of community on V3, V4, uh, changes going forward, what this means for you. You're all excited, some woohoos to go start hacking on content and plugins. Would... Yeah. Do, do, do. A question around the plugin. Uh, do you have any plans to pass on any like a variables or anything to those as a parameters? Like a class callback. Um, callback? Yeah. yeah. Is that your favorite subject? <laughs> I know, Shane. Yeah, it, it's on the list. It's it's on our list of things to add as an ability to send that back. Um, okay. it's, it's, yeah, there's, there's it's, no technical bar to it. It's a matter of formalizing how it wants to work. Um, yeah. So to give a little bit of background, um, a plugin can basically do anything that's possible to do to digital rebar via the API. Um, mm -hmm. The question is, you know, what the best pattern for any given plugin to use is and formalizing that or passing parameters back and forth. So, okay. And a lot of that boils down to specific use cases uh, for whatever system you're trying to make callback talk to. So. I mean, I was just thinking loud is, I mean, can we have as a parameters which says, you know, this is argument parameters and this is a data parameter. Yeah, that some of that's already there. It's just not plumbed quite the way you want it. It's not necessarily a hard change. It's just a timing thing. Um, actually, we can open issues on those now. Which yes. Is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just referencing the conversation here for folks, the callback plugin is a really cool uh, plugin that allows you to be able to make generic RESTful API calls to external infrastructure services, which allows you to do a lot more uh, integration with your infrastructure as part of workflow without having to write a specific plugin to your system. Since RESTful patterns are pretty common and standard, uh, we put together callback as a solution uh, from some of our other customer engagements where we're building custom plugins and it was like, well, this is silly because the RESTful verbs are all basically the same. Uh, the first iteration of it has uh, the ability to push machine objects to remote systems and Safia is asking about the ability to be able to do more and interesting things with a callback. So uh, that's the discussion around callback. Callbacks now open here, as you can see, and so getting uh, feedback from the community either through uh, issues with enhancement requests or uh, thoughts on things to do with it would be fantastic for going forward with it. Um, so that exists in the provision plugins commands callback uh, structure. Uh, any other questions from community? So many of you and so few questions. We couldn't have covered everything so awesomely. Hi, the, Apparently we did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm still trying. Uh, I'm still struggling with some uh, installation issues. Um, so if um, there's some update to the, uh, I mean, installation documentation. Um, I could use them. Um, so yeah, just trying to get my previous um, installation to work with the new release. Um, okay. Um, are you, Bo, in uh, dropping questions in Pound Community in Slack would be awesome. Um, 
we know that there are some rough patches around the installer and we're working on getting those better. So if there's something specific you're seeing, we'd like to know. We have iterated on the install script uh, quite heavily over the last uh, couple of days. It's seen a lot of changes to fix up some of the issues and also add some new features to it. Um, so if you have specifics, uh, hit us up on community channel. We'd love to make sure we get those fixed. Okay, just just one quick one. Uh, we used to use the uh, uh, tips to get the installer. Uh, does that still work or I should uh, get back to stable? I mean... Uh, uh, tips goes away as a construct in general in the new V3, V4 uh, split. That's actually a very good uh, point to make is in the old days, uh, we used to track things with uh, in Git uh, through repository uh, management of master, stable, and tip. And uh, tip was a slightly behind the very top of the tree where we thought it was kind of stable so you could go play with it construct. And stable were pointed to the latest release version. Uh, that has gone away as well as master. So currently the uh, main uh, branch to work from is v4. Uh, and make and, and submit changes against v4 and stable and tip go away. Now, we are maintaining in some places uh, the concepts of stable. Uh, for example, in the catalog, uh, content plugins, digital rebar provision itself, and other constructs in the catalog have a stable component. Uh, the installer had its own stable and tip component, and we are currently maintaining the two names, but they're identical. There's no current difference between those uh, two, between a sort of non-stable and tip version. Um, I would suggest pulling from stable, uh, especially if you're using it in production capacity. Okay. Yeah, okay. well, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will post uh, follow-up questions um, in the community channel. Perfect. Thanks, Bo. Um, any other last questions? Otherwise, we're going to cut over to David to talk about Kubernetes, crib, and stuff like that, fun things. OK, as always, uh, ping us. Pound community on the Slack channel. If you aren't on Slack already, I don't know what you're waiting for. Let us know. We'll add you. Uh, go to rackn.com slash support slash Slack for an invite or on the front page of rebar.digital. I believe we have a link to it somewhere in here. Um, down here, rackn something or other. Slack community. There it is. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to pass things over to David. David Young has been working on a lot of changes to the Kubernetes uh, installer component. David showed us some really cool things he was doing around etcd, ingress controllers, I don't know, all kinds of cool stuff uh, two weeks ago. Um, he's also going to show us a little bit more of the work he's done around the Ceph side of things. Uh, David, if you're ready, I'm going to let you take it away and all yours. Cool. Thank you, Shane. Uh, hello, this is David. Uh, I don't have anything concrete to talk about today, but Shane asked me to show off some more of the things that we've been doing. Uh, so if you have any questions, please just interrupt me and ask, and I will kind of pan through um, in a bit more detail some of the stuff that we covered last week. Uh, probably the first thing to talk about is I wanted to show you Ceph. So there, we've, we've put some um, contributions into Crib recently to, to deploy the more, more up-to-date versions of Rook Ceph. Uh, and I think it's really cool because I really like Ceph. Um, I wanted to show you a bit about how it works. So I'm going to share my screen here. And if I can figure this out, here we go. Um, share screen, thank you. Yeah. Uh, now, when you deploy Rook Ceph by default, uh, the Ceph operator runs and starts up a pod on each one of your nodes as a, as a daemon set uh, and uses local storage. Is that right? Yes, it does. Uh, sort of create a local volume on your cloud provider and use that as its Ceph uh, OSD. That kind of means you're 
you're running a storage cluster inside a storage cluster. Uh, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to run Ceph on physical drives attached to our Kubernetes nodes. And we also wanted to do it using uh, dedicated 10 gig interfaces that we have on our nodes. So our nodes each have a, like a one gig interface and a 10 gig interface. A, a traditional Rook Ceph deployment would just do everything within the cluster and all the cluster communications would happen inside of Kubernetes, which is great for management, but it's not that performant. Uh, there is a new parameter that we've added to crib, well, the crib uh, c content, which will let you customize the way Ceph deploys itself. And what you're seeing here is the result of a customized config. I've got four nodes. Uh, Ceph is really hard to set up uh, out of the box, but Rook makes it nice and easy so long as you feed it the kind of information it's looking for. So we've we fed Ceph, we fed Rook with uh, a, a regular expression that says you're allowed to use any operating system drive that you find that matches the string. Uh, and more specifically, we've told it exactly which uh, IP addresses to use uh, for its cluster communication. I'll see if I can show you that. It goes into a config map here. Uh, That's not good. But yeah, this is the this is the key. This Rook Ceph override config map. And I have local issues. It's a little bit messy because the JSON is all squished together, but what you'll see here is that uh, we're overriding some standard Ceph variables. Public network is my uh, standard management network, and then this cluster network, provided I actually have an address in this range, 10, 200, 200, 0, Rook Ceph will, will recognize that and start using that to transfer data around. The results, oh, something else cool that it does is it by default will install its dashboard. And I've just managed to make that work after breaking it, so I'm going to change my screen sharing here. Oh, before I do that, you deploy the dashboard and it self configures its credentials into a Kubernetes secret. So you have to then paste in a command. Come on, terminal. Terminal is not responding, thank you. I did something in Zoom to try and start sharing a screen and now my keyboard is gone. Try this. Oh, bad luck, okay. I'll just share the dashboard with you directly. Basically you have to paste in a uh, a cube cuddle string which decodes one of your secrets uh, to get you access to the dashboard. Here's my dashboard. It's on the other monitor. Yeah. Right. How's that? Oh, still no keyboard. That's embarrassing. Remember those demo guards that don't like us? <laughs> right, we, we have no every keyboard. Every so. day, every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a fail. I don't know why, but my keyboard is not responding. My mouse is working fine and I can drive the interface, but I have no keyboard, so we'll just talk. Uh, Ceph sort of splits your data storage into um, as many OSDs as you have. Like if you have a pizza, you slice into eight slices, you have eight individual ones and will auto recover if you lose a node. So what we tested last week is with four nodes, we killed one. Uh, Ceph complained, oh, I'm, I'm not happy, I've lost 33% 30, of my data, but then really quickly would self recover and those remaining nodes will sync up and make sure that there's 
X amount of uh, copies of the data that you want. We killed a second load, so now we have a two out of four. Again, it complained, wasn't able to fully recover because it's got a default of saying I need at least three copies of every, every piece of data I have, but it's still operational. Uh, although, yeah, so, so you can lose up to two nodes and run in a degraded state. All these parameters are, are, are very tweakable. Uh, let's see about what else I can show you with my mouse. Uh, oh, I wanted to talk so about I BGP. Had, I had a question hmm. for you, David. Yeah. Um, you kind of launched straight into stuff and plumbing stuff in through Rook. Um, what's sort of one of the primary use cases for um, Rook stuff through Kubernetes like this? Are, are you looking at using this for uh, backing uh, volumes for containers or for generic uh, storage for just external generic storage uh, store? Uh, oh, that's what what is your primary question. use case you're driving towards here? Cool. So primary use case definitely is storage within a Kubernetes cluster. It's actually fairly hard to use Rook Ceph from outside your Kubernetes cluster because all of the authentication and the, the ports exposed and stuff are happening inside Kube. So what what we needed to do is for our bare metal cube cluster, we need to have some persistent storage. Uh, and we don't want to use local storage and things. We want it to be resilient and reliable and so forth, just like the whole um, highly available crib install. So yeah, Ceph is our way of providing storage into Kubernetes. And because of the way Ceph uh, works in the back end, where basically it's got this um, block storage model. You would just tell Seth, hey, I need a volume. It's 100 gigs in size. Thank you, make it. And Seth goes and, and allocates that amount of raw space for you, calls it a volume, and gives you access. It means that provisioning storage for your pods is almost instant. Um, so in, in our design, Rook Seth takes on the role of whatever Google cloud storage would do or AWS, um, EBS and so on. You, you ask for storage, you get it. When you finish with it, you delete it. And behind the scenes, Ceph is managing all of that. Perfect, thank you. The, basically it's a persist, persistent volume provider, right? For the Kubernetes system, right? It's, yes. that, it's that structure or that and there, there, there are some others that we evaluated. Uh, we looked at open EBS but that's a little bit more abstracted. Open EBS doesn't have the uh, facility to talk directly to, to your, your on-host block storage. So Open EBS would be something that you would run on top of, say, uh, Google Cloud, and then you'd get this extra storage layer that is more resilient than just individual pods with individual uh, volumes attached to them. The, the long-term goal, um, Part of what we're building is we're evaluating Jenkins X as a full on-prem CI CD solution. It's been a little bit hairy so far. It's, it's still quite an immature project, uh, but we wanted to be able to do uh, read write once as well as read write many data storage. Um, Ceph can do this. It's, there are kind of four ways to access your data in Ceph. The, the, the way I just described is the classic way is, is volumes. And that's a one-to-one -one relationship. So you're going to have a pod. Chef will give you a volume. That pod can access that volume and you're happy. But Chef can also run a, an object store interface like Amazon S3. So you could talk to it as if it was S3. Uh, and can even run um, NFS. So you could, if you really wanted to, have 20 pods all accessing the same data store via NFS. And Rook Chef does all that within Kube. So you don't have to fluff about with all the config yourself, which is the, the best part. Uh, any more questions about Ceph? I thought we might just talk quickly about uh, a Metal LB as well. Uh, so for Ceph, you mentioned about standalone uh, Ceph nodes. Can you use uh, like secondary data drives on, on your like your pod itself on the node itself uh, instead of a dedicated standalone uh, Ceph node? Uh, yeah, I think if, if I understand you correctly, that's exactly what we're doing. Let me show you something. So this is my rack end install or my, my DRP install. And I have a very messy profile. 
it defines how I install this. There is a parameter down here. Here we are, Rook Ceph target disk. So these three params here are what controls how Ceph installs itself. This, this custom config that I mentioned, it's all built into the, uh, the workflow that we've got in Crib. But when Ceph runs, it'll apply, it'll like, discover disks. It'll use this regex here to say, I'm allowed to use any disks starting with SD whatever. Now in our case, we run that operating system on our nodes on a NVMe drive. So it's not gonna have a path that starts with SD. So when Ceph deploys itself, if it finds an unused disk that matches this regex, it will just claim it and start using it. But if the disk has partitions or if it's used by something else, Ceph won't touch it. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? No? On your stuff, what, yeah, I have a, on your stuff deployment, um, I see you're specifying networks as cluster network and public network. Yes. Um, but is there a mechanism currently with the Rook stuff pieces to be able to say, these are my storage class servers. I have these 10 machines that are all 24 drive machines and I want my stuff served out of here as opposed, you know, sort of the classic separation of storage versus compute concept. Thinking about that. Uh, there probably is, there's, a, there's, a, there's some significant logic that goes into this, this part here about Ceph choosing which disk to use. Um, yeah. I, and, I, I, so this is Greg. When I was looking at Brooke and Ceph, um, Shane, there are ways to do it. I don't know if David set it up that way because his model isn't for that, but there are ways to tag nodes in um, Kubernetes so that Ceph, um, Rook wouldn't deploy the OSDs on certain subsets. Yep, but, yeah. I was getting at that point. Didn't know if this, this piece was able to do the tagging and yeah. matching. It's not something we've built into our uh, DRP um, contributions yet, but it would be as simple as a parameter, presumably. There's a, um, I'll show you where the code goes. Um, actually, no, I can't because I have no keyboard, but we effectively just insert little customizations into, into Rook's config map and provided you do what they expect, it's, it's very customizable. Any further questions about Ceph? No, cool. Okay, it's complicated, but it's really cool when it works. Uh, I've, I've, I've broken it a couple times recently. I was really hoping to show you this dashboard, but it's not much use without a keyboard. Ah. Uh, probably the other thing I wanted to talk about is, is Metal LB. We struggled for a while to, to find, it's a, it's a common problem. If you're running Kube, especially in HA, uh, on bare metal or in your on-prem, you don't get the advantage of a cloud-based load balancer. So exposing anything in Kube is hard. You've got to deal with how do you get traffic into your network through your firewall and to the correct node. We've extended the support for Metal LB in Crib. It, it, it was originally layer two and now it's layer three. Uh, I'll talk a bit about what layer three does is if you're, so, so I'm running with a single pu public address, four nodes behind that. Uh, when incoming traffic hits the public address, the firewall needs to know where do I send this traffic uh, and which node happens to be running the, the ingress controller. Metal LB is a, will, will listen to how does it work now? Oh, it, it listens to, to Kube services. When a service is exposed with a type load balancer, Metal LB will, using BGP, advertise to your firewall and say, hey, this particular address you can get to through me. Uh, and I have a screenshot that I can show you that doesn't require a keyboard. Here it is here. So this is my little um, ubiquity edge router firewall, which happens to be able to do BGP. 
And at the, the time that I did this, I had three services exposed. Each one advertises a slash 32, like an individual route uh, to the firewall. And the firewall knows which node to use to send the traffic back. Take for example, this first route here, uh, 34.1. If that node were to die, then there would be uh, metal LB, or no, sorry, let me say it again. Then kube will move the pod that runs the service onto a different node. Metal LB, which is running on all the nodes, will, will advertise the new route to the firewall and the traffic will continue to come to the node. Um, it, this metal LB combined with external DNS, another uh, element we've plugged in, means that you can expose as many services as you want privately without having to deal with the, the, the lack of load balancing capability that you would get in Kube otherwise. Uh, sorry, it's a bit hard to show you without having a, mouth, uh, a, a keyboard, but it, it works really seamlessly. I can expose a service. Um, the um, external DNS service will go and add that to Route 53 so the DNS works and points back to my public address. Uh, traffic hits my firewall and the firewall knows where to send the traffic based on what Metal LB has done. Okay, David, quick uh, interjection there. I need to wrap up here and close up shop for the hour. Yep. Um, do you have any last uh, statements or comments there? Uh, no. Uh, cool. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. So the primary pieces we got to see there from uh, David was Metal LB for routing traffic in and out uh, for ingress controllers within the cluster and then Seth providing uh, container storage for the cluster as well, which is really cool because uh, persistent containers has always been a really big topic in the Kubernetes world and for the first oh, year or so or three or something in Kubernetes journal, it was something that was very painful to do and getting reliable uh, container st uh, persistent storage volumes was a pretty hard thing to do. And now all of that's plumbed up uh, in crib in large part uh, thanks to uh, David and some of the other community members' active support and maintenance of adding those things in. Um, really appreciate the work you're doing there and appreciate the, um, walking us through some of the cool things there. Uh, David is on Pound Community, Racken's on Pound Community. Please feel free to ping us if you have questions. Uh, the Kubernetes crib stuff has really grown a tremendous amount of support. Um, Going to leave the last uh, minute or three for community. Uh, if anyone has questions from community, uh, if not, we'll wrap up and call it a day. So tossing it out there, community members, if you chat questions to us uh, or if you uh, unmute yourself, fire us any questions and let's hear from you. Do, 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 do. Thank you. I will take that as a no question. So everyone, that's a wrap for Digital Rebar uh, meetup number 41, uh, discussions on uh, platform V3 to V4 changes and Kubernetes, uh, Crib, Ceph, uh, Metal LB changes. David, I uh, really appreciate your time and uh, efforts and contributions back to Crib. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks for version 42 uh, agenda to come soon. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, all. Bye.